Patty Tawadros, and I'm your host today of Money Matters TV, and we're joined by my co-host, Paul cool. Mitchell, who is a commercial banker, and a little later we're going to be joined by his friend, Jerry Klein, who works for Obermeyer. It's great to see you, yeah. Paul. I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. Yeah, today, absolutely. Patty. So tell me, the thing I'm interested about sure. is commercial real estate in Philadelphia and all these multi-unit buildings that are going right, up. Right. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, it's so it's so segmented. There's, I'm, I'm in banking, and we finance uh, banks finance most of that kind of, type of real estate development. Right. But it's all over the place. For example, is it a big project? Is it you know a five million dollar project? Is it putting up a, a thirty story b apartment building? Um, lots of big banks like to finance that, and they like to deal with experienced developers that have done similar projects in the last ten years. Okay. A lot of what you see in, in uh, Philadelphia and other uh, metropolitan areas these days are the onesie twosie deals. One so, or two row homes together? Yeah, or a house, a hundred year old house mm -hmm. that's, you know, not in great condition, that type of thing. And uh, somebody buys it for, I'll say, a song, so to speak. They rip it down. Like the Revel. Well, <laughs> 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 for that's a real song. <laughs> yeah. You can whistle Dixie to that one. But, uh, and they put up a, a brand new building. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a it's a one shot deal, one house, one row house, small small piece of real estate. Frequently, those small in, um, uh, deals are done by I'll call them amateur investors slash developers. Uh, you or me, we have a full time job. Right. We say, oh gee, real estate's a good thing to invest in. Scrape together a little down payment, maybe you and me and a couple, maybe a couple partners or something like that, and then we'll go to the bank to finance that. Now, if you were the bank and somebody like you or me comes in to do this type of real estate project, what would be your initial reaction? Eh, pass. What do you know about it? Yeah, it seems like it would be easier and take the same amount of time to lend to someone with experience doing 20 buildings. Exactly. Yeah. So there's different aspects, segments of the market. Right. And uh, you know, different banks like to do different types of things. So the small community bank, okay, mm -hmm. is probably not gonna do a $15 million or tw you know, $20 million 30-story apartment complex. But they'll do the little things okay. in their neighborhood, in their particular community. Be able to know the people that are doing this a, l you know, a bit better um, than somebody else. So I just went to uh, an informational session for this Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business oh, Program. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I'd like to get in it. You know, mm -hmm. In case anyone sees it, I hope yeah, they'll, yeah, they'll yeah. consider me even more. But they talked about financing. I think PIDC was there to uh -huh, talk about sure. where individual investors can get financing. And there were uh -huh. all these people sitting around the table. And I thought, all you're here for is to figure out where you can get money. That was all the questions they were asking, uh -huh. which was really interesting. And then it makes you think, oh, if they're doing it, I could do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. There you go. And history repeats itself. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, tw 20 years ago, um, well, less than 20 years ago, the last re uh, recession was about nine or 10 years ago. And it was a very hot market. Everybody was getting into the, the market. Everybody was trying to finance real estate. And the lenders were financing 90, maybe 100% of the project, financing the land. Really, 100%? Well, going back 25 years ago, people were getting over 100% financing. I remember those days. I also remember the no-doc loans, where sure, I just sure. told them what I made, and they said, that's fantastic. Yeah, here's, yeah. A, here's a check. I was once uh, working at um, a, a large area bank and running their mezzanine fund. This is for operating companies like uh, Urban Outfitters or a company like that. And I had real estate lenders at the bank coming to me and saying, Paul, could you help us finance this, provide some gap financing for these real estate projects we're being asked to look. Other banks are financing 100, 110, 120 percent of the project. And I looked at them and said, well, let's say I did. What do you think my interest rate would be? It's not going to be four percent for that additional risk. It's going to be a high percent rate. So the mo the market was pretty <coughs> frothy at that time. That's what happens in whether it's the real estate market yeah. or the economy in general. You, you know, know what is interesting that I heard on the on the news it was uh, a little pre-election. I don't know when this will air. I'm sure before the election was the little debacle that went down with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and it was about. Uh, Donald Trump saying that he was predicting or assuming the market was going to collapse and he 
maybe was hoping for it so that well, he could some, buy some, real some estate? Some years back, well, the, yeah. when the recession occurred, right before the recession occurred, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then he well, said, oh, Hillary wants to buy them at a uh, top dollar. Yeah. Who doesn't want to buy them at a discount, right? Well, Warren Buffett, the famous investor, said, um, what was it, uh, when the tide is going out, mm -hmm. the um, something comes in. I don't know. Anyway, when, when things are bad, that's when you get real, real good deals. Yeah, and that's when people should invest. So maybe not right now in Philadelphia, unless you're willing to go to the fringes of the city. You really have to know what you're doing. If you're an amateur investor, whether it's buying stocks, bonds, or investing in real estate, beware, beware. I mean, it takes a lot of experience and the ups and downs and to see the markets you know, change and that type of thing to really know what you're doing. I think we've all probably lost our shirts on some sort of real estate deal. I know I have. Well, most homeowners did, um, uh, you know, nine, nine, uh, eight years ago. Yeah. I mean, down as much as forty percent. A lot of people say, "Well, I'm not going to own a home again because it's not a great, it's not a, sh a sure investment. I'd rather rent." So the apartment building industry has been skyrocketing to the extent really now has. people are talking about it's, it's 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 saturated. There are more people, you know, more apartments being built and planned to be built. There are people that are going to be able to interested in filling them. Yeah, and you can see that tanking one day. I just don't understand what person who's retired wants to think about paying rent every single month. You mm -hmm. know, I, I was excited when I paid my car off. Right. You know, not to have a payment for ten years. I, I want to pay off a home and mm -hmm. be done with it, and be able to retire. Well, that's 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 a good attitude. Talking about um, you know real estate financing, um, I've had customers that. Um, Bought, invest in real estate, a small you know, parcel might have been a, like maybe a restaurant or some other kind of commercial f f facility. And uh, th they invested in that real estate with the thought of supplementing their retirement income. Recession comes along, two years later, they're sucking money out of their retirement investments to keep the real estate investment afloat. That's what an amateur investor can get involved in. That sounds like a bad idea. So if you're going to be an amateur investor, I would find some professionals to surround yourself with that have been through it before and know what they're doing. That's good advice. Thanks. Well, how about your industry? What's going on there? So I have definitely seen a shift in how things are financed and how things are sold. So the software companies, especially, I see it. I bought software for my business, a design suite from Adobe. Mm -hmm. And I would buy it once every few years because it was expensive between six and seven hundred dollars and you have to mm -hmm. buy a license for each person and now they've changed it so the next upgrade i do and i've been holding back is now going to be seventy dollars a month per person so they changed their model for that's, making that's, that's, that's eight hundred and forty dollars yeah yeah my quick math yeah that's good so <laughs> i see that that's how they're shifting and i find it really frustrating as a business owner that my costs have gone up mm -hmm. but then i thought about how i could change my costs and mm -hmm. we decided to modify our business model and to go from doing websites one at a time and charging a one-time hit, fifteen to 30000 and up, mm -hmm. to going to a subscription model where people pay a one-time entry-level cost that's mm -hmm. affordable, 4000 6000 yeah. depending mm -hmm. on the firm, and then having a reoccurring payment over the course of three years, five years, mm -hmm. depending on how big a project it is. Yeah. Well, as a banker lender, you know, I love that model. Yeah. Of recurring revenues. Lots like of recurring <laughs> revenues instead of these big hits that either occur or don't occur. And when we started that and thinking about it, I was kind of resistant to it because I think, no, I need that money now. And then I started to do the numbers and I see how that accumulates over just the course of six months. We're making more money than we're making now if we do the sales that support you it. You could call it almost a, an annuity. Yeah. And Gar the goal is income, to yeah. position the company to sell it. And by being on the show a few times and hearing about small businesses being sold, mm -hmm. I realized that if I positioned my company and had a steady recurring revenue, that it would be something that I could sell. Right. Not just not just dependent upon maybe the skills of a super salesperson or the owner of the company right. or, some, or something like that, um, which is uh, more, more variable. Yeah. But if, if somebody buys the, the business, you're not there running it, maybe things will change dramatically. Yeah. But if you have lots of little stuff and lots of customers, you're paying a little bit all the time, they're not so dependent upon one person or not. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah. So let me ask you a question. Sure. From the audience. This is from Finley Marks from Marion, mm -hmm. and he wants to know, what areas of the stock market are buys when interest rates go up? Okay. Well, uh, whether they're buys, that's kind of a, an extreme, uh, I guess, uh, statement. Um, 
One thing about investing is that it's, uh, you really can't make generalities. You can't make generalities about industries. You can't make generalities about uh, kinds of stocks. You really shouldn't make uh, generalities about uh, market timing either. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to some of my earlier comments about in the real estate market, it's, it's segmented. You know, maybe small little investments, you know, larger ones, that type of thing. Uh, the same thing with um, uh, uh, industries that are dependent upon uh, interest rates. It, it depends. For example, you could talk about banks. Banks are uh, generally a, a, um, a good segment to invest in when interest rates are higher. Now, why is that? So, because they charge higher rates to the consumers and they're paying a lot more money? Well, not necessarily, that's not really accurate because banks, most of the bank's money that they lend out is lent out on a spread. They have a cost of money. You have a savings account. Mm -hmm. They pay you interest of, let's say, 2%, maybe recently 0.1%. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to lend out at 3% at, at three, 3 more than that. Okay. Okay, they work on a spread. However, the capital of a bank, okay, has no cost. So let's say a, uh, a community bank has a $100 million of capital. Okay, which you know the investors put in the money, and it, it also the capital increase as the bank made money. That capital has no cost to it. You can call it free money, so to speak. So if interest rates are three percent, <coughs> it's going to make, um, I guess, uh, hundred million, th uh, three million dollars on that hundred million dollars. Three percent of hundred million is, is is three million dollars. Right. If interest rates are six percent, the bank's going to make. Six million dollars. So they would capital. love to Double raise their rates. Have the interest the Fed rates holds them back. Well, they've been well, they've been so extremely low. It's really been hurting banks. Ab absolutely. Oh, that there's makes there's sense. a there's a there's a happy medium there. Mm -hmm. When interest rates some years back, some decades back, were up to 15, 18 percent, or even twenty one percent, the economy has been killed by that. It's just, just how how can you survive with those? super high interest level rates. I remember rates. my parents' mortgage rates were somewhere around 10 or 12% in the early 80s. So, so banks weren't exactly yeah. licking their chops that they were just making money hand over fist because nobody could afford to, really to pay that an extended period yeah. of time. They're just going to go, you know, go bankrupt or something. That's crazy. Well, thank you for answering his question. And uh, if you would like to send your question into Money Matters, here's how to do it. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is seconds. money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, T-V dot com. Okay, and we're joined now by Jerry Klein, a partner at Obermeyer. Thank you for being here today. Good to be here. Good to be with uh, my buddy, uh, Paul Mitchell. <laughs> Yeah, you guys are old-time friends, right? Well, yeah. we've known each other for, I don't know, a couple of decades, it seems. Yeah, at least. <laughs> I should have you move over, and I'll interview both of you about your old shenanigans. <laughs> no, uh, Jerry, Jerry's the one that's the, our featured guest uh, this yeah. evening. We, we, are, we are honored. Uh, very experienced real, uh, real estate attorney. So you practice real estate primarily? Yeah. Um, my background is uh, sort of uh, unique in the sense that uh, after I graduated from law school, I went to a graduate law school to get a Master of Laws degree in land development and natural resources. So that was the uh, component that I used to further uh, my interest in real estate and my activity and involvement with it. Uh, I took that and parlayed it with a financial uh, undergraduate degree and uh, my practice uh, all these years has been real estate and uh, real estate finance and that that includes a uh, large amount of banking and uh, the kinds of things that uh, Paul's been talking about today. Now is that commercial real estate and residential real estate or how, how would you segment your, your practice? Well w in terms of the practice of law we do not distinguish in terms of product types, whether it be residential or commercial or big or small, sophisticated or single family, that type of thing. We run the gamut. So that's Obermeyer or the, no, the I, practice I, in I, general? I would say the practice of law generally. 
So people don't specialize in just one area? Right. Oh, I didn't realize that. I just thought you would want to go to someone who that's all they did. Look, like, like a doctor who's either a heart surgeon. You don't want to just go to a, a general surgeon. You want to go to a heart surgeon if you've got a heart problem. There, there are um, attorneys who like to subspecialize in terms of condominiums or in terms of mortgage securitization or whatever, whatever the case might be. But, uh, but generally, uh, real estate in and of itself is a specialty. Okay. How has your practice changed over the years? And you have been a, uh, an attorney for, for a long time. Uh, the practice of law has undergone what I would consider to be a cosmic change in the sense that uh, in many respects it's no longer a profession. It's really uh, morphed into a, a business. And uh, it's changed its complexion almost completely. Uh, we're seeing forces at play now that we hadn't seen historically. For example, law schools are having difficulty recruiting now. Why is that? Um, because of the cost of it, for one thing. Mm -hmm. The families are having to take out loans to pay for that education. Students are seeing that it's a three-year commitment, and the, if, for the most part, they're not able to generate and earn income during that time. But most important, there are very few jobs awaiting them. Hmm. So when you, when you take all of these factors into account, you see that the landscape is much different today than it had been historically. Why are there less legal lawyer jobs? I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get it either. I'm Colony's so surprised. Growing, more entities around. Well, it, well, everything in this country is cyclical. And when times are better, uh, let's talk about the field of real estate where I practice. Mm -hmm. um, when, when we had the downturn, in 2007, eight, in that arena. It's the first time in my career that when interest rates were low, the uh, market basically tanked. Previous to that, it was only when mortgage interest rates went up and started to get into, uh, uh, let's just say, double digits. Mm -hmm that we saw a tremendous impact on the market. I never thought I would see a time when interest rates would be low, extraordinarily yeah. low, mm -hmm. and, the, and the market would, would be in a basic free fall. So that had to do with the tech bubble bursting? Well, I think it had to do with a lot of things. I mean, we all heard about um, the, the, the meltdown, the, the subprime loans mm -hmm. and all of that stuff things that people are now familiar with uh, that you saw in the, uh, uh, the big short mm -hmm. um, and, and that kind of controversy. Everyone yeah. is aware of it. Yeah, it was a financial meltdown. You couldn't, uh, right. there was no liquidity in the marketplace. That's why the government stepped in to provide liquidity, if you can imagine that. That is, liquidity is money flowing back and forth. Well, it, got just, it just dried up. There was hardly any money flowing back and forth. Uh, I, I, in the in investment banking business, it was almost impossible to get a deal done because whoever was going to put up the money, they had to have confidence that in you know, six months or a year or two years, their investment in this business or this operation, or project, whatever it was, was going to be worth significantly more than what it was when they were making the investment. They didn't have that confidence. And they said, therefore, we're not going to do it. The, the flow of money stopped. What I think is very interesting is that when we saw this meltdown in 2008, it was, it was apparent to me that we would come back, but come back very, very slowly. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. How far do you think we've come? Well, it, it, if we had a chart or a, a, a blackboard mm -hmm. and we just drew a, a line that was slow but st steadily increasing or r rising, mm -hmm. And you look at what happened in 2008, over nine years, it got to this point, and if you make that comparison, you see that it's so tremendously different today. What about all the activity that's going on in Atlantic City? If you take the Ravel Casino, I don't know if it's really been purchased or not purchased, and then is it Bart Blatstein who bought the pier down in Atlantic City? Do you well, get involved with things like that? Well, those yeah, types of uh, things? I, I do. I happen not to be involved in those deals, but 
Uh, coincidentally, Atlantic City is my hometown. Oh. So, and... Um, you went to high school there. I did go to high yeah. school there. And um, uh, I have a tremendous interest in what's going on in the city. Um, it's shocking how things have uh, evolved in Atlantic City. And even now, um, it's a constant struggle. There's a question as to whether the city ultimately will file a bankruptcy. Uh, right now, New Jersey passed a, uh, a law to give uh, Atlantic City some breathing room mm -hmm. until they, quote, get their act together. And, and the question is whether they'll be able to do that or whether the state will ultimately take it over. But it, it really wasn't planned right from the beginning. They didn't have a, in my view anyway, a comprehensive plan that made any sense. Uh, there was an oversupply, obviously, of casinos and, and really sort of a hodgepodge in terms of development. On a more positive note, Jerry, where's, where's the positive stuff in, in real estate these days? Are there certain segments that are doing better than others? Uh, if, you were, if you had um, $400 million to invest, where, where would you put your money? Well, th there's an interesting uh, dynamic at play right now. One is, in my view, uh, the one product type that seems to have sustained itself um, the best uh, is the multifamily industry, mm -hmm. which is rental housing or apartments, as you might know them. Uh, but like anything else, if you look at our marketplace here in Philadelphia, uh, and we've seen this historically, the, the real estate has always been very cyclical. Mm -hmm. So in, in the course of my career, I've already been through five cycles. <laughs> at least. <laughs> and, and, and what happens is there's, there's a band of reasonableness where uh, there's a demand uh, curve that has to be satisfied with supply. The problem is that developer A, B, C, D get into the, mm -hmm. the market not knowing that E, F, G, and H are coming <laughs> in as well. Yeah. And then ultimately, the, the, uh, the supply goes beyond the band and somehow then has to find its way back. Those, those units are not going to be able to be absorbed, do you in think my the view. City, do you think the city should help to control how many permits are can't. issued? Well, you can't control it on that basis. It, ideally, it would be great if, if there was an overseer that said, okay, we have a, a, a demand of X mm -hmm. and we, we can't oversupply it. And then people bid to get the opportunity yeah. to build. But no, nobody a really knows. I mean, if all these different uh, demographic uh, forces at work, I mean, uh, baby boomers, you know, uh, empty nesters, you know, want to come to the city, that's a, that's a really growth type of thing. Well, how much, how much I I is there of that, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I've seen it, you know, in, in banking, yeah, the cycles. And there are a few people, um, I remember one recession I had, I was in the workout department of, of a bank, real estate workout department, and I had uh, one customer that uh, said he saw it coming. Said, saw wow. what coming? The real estate recession. Really? Yes. So he started, he had about maybe eight or nine projects, not big ones, but out in the suburbs. He sold several of them, and he started getting tenants that he would keep his rents low, but he felt there really would be very stable tenants. And he made it through. I'll say easily, because he saw what was coming and, and did something about it. Most other people, all these smart people, all these genius investors, they never saw it coming. Well, I think the good news is that, um, and we talked about this before in terms of where interest rates are going, mm -hmm. uh, the Federal Reserve clearly is going to bump up interest rates, but very, very slowly. And for the real estate industry, in my view anyway, um, there should be comfort and confidence that those rates, while they will be uh, ascending once again, will be doing so slowly. And uh, there's, there's uh, plenty of light uh, ahead before we have uh, any more uh, of a significant downturn or any kind of recessionary period, in, in I feel. And the implication of why interest rates will go up, why the Federal Reserve wants them to you know, go up, is to rain in the economy. Because rain it, it in? Yes, because the economy is growing. And if it, if it doesn't rain in it interest rates, it might grow too fast, cause um, high inflation, and hurt the economy. That's, what, that's the tool they're using. So the reason they're talking about higher interest rates is because of a good thing, the growth. 
Do you agree, Jerry? I absolutely do. I never realized they would try and rein in the growth of the country. The, they want it to be in a, in, a, in, a, in a band, not too slow, not too fast. Well, the one thing that the Federal Reserve cares about more than anything else is inflation. Mm -hmm. And right now we're dealing with almost insignificant inflation. So by bumping those rates up, there's, there's no risk that we're going to overheat and, and it is pulling the economy back, as, as Paul says. And I, I think that's imminent. Mm -hmm. How do you see lenders now, now responding? Are they, are they still skittish? Are they being overly aggressive? What about the due diligence aspect? I think lenders are, are skittish. Uh, I think they're doing more in terms of due diligence. Uh, I think uh, in, in one sense, they continue to make the same mistakes that they made historically and have failed to learn from the mistakes that they've made in the past. What so do you, you think see the biggest that mistake is? Pardon me? What is the biggest mistake they've made? Repeatedly. Making bad loans. Oh. Uh, and, and that takes on a whole variety of configurations. Uh, it's, it's not doing the proper underwriting. It's not um, it's doing not the due diligence that you need to do. And it's not know. every bank. It's not all banks. You no. can't put, say, oh, banks are now doing this, or they're all doing the same stupid thing. Mm -hmm. Some banks. Just like the Great Meltdown wasn't caused by right. 300 banks. It was pr caused primarily by the few biggest banks. <laughs> so do you think it's a good time to invest in real estate still? I personally think it is uh, because we're still in, in an upward spiral. Mm -hmm. um, you're not catching the market at the apex in my view. Mm -hmm. There's still plenty of room for growth. Uh, we still haven't completely come back from where we were in 2007, uh, eight. So, uh, yes, I'd recommend it. That's good to know. Yeah. Is there just one last thing you could say? Uh, what is the line when you should stop? Is there a, when the interest uh, rates get know? too yeah, high? How do you know when the cycle is uh, getting to the top? You don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Jerry's an attorney and not a professional real estate investor, perhaps. <laughs> Well, thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. My uh, pleasure. I know you were a little surprised by your, by your host today. <laughs> so next week, we're going to be joined by Chris Nisbet, and he is with J. Carroll Malloy Realtors. So we're going to get a little bit more information on real estate. Thank you for joining us today on Money Matters TV. <laughs>